You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 229 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Hands On Gloves, the all-in-one revolutionary bathing grooming gloves. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. Today, we have two guests on that with a combined equitation knowledge of about 110 years or more, we have Monty Roberts and some training background from him is that uh, he knows when to push on with the horse and when to back off. So that's going to be our our guest um, question today that we wanted to take to him. And then also we have Nicole Chastain, who is, her background is over 30 years in dressage. But I, what I like about Nicole, which was really fun, is that she doesn't matter what the saddle is, what the bridle is even really what the breed is, but she has done some amazing things outside of the dressage world. It's an extension of the discipline into things like working equitation. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month. I have my producer, Jen, with me to help today. How are you, Jen? Greetings, Debbie. How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. You pushing all the buttons back there for me? I'm pushing all the buttons. How's it going planning for the movement? It's coming up in what? Oh, uh, gosh, yeah. Thanks for asking. It's June 16, 17, 18, and it's coming right along. We've got some rock stars coming here. I get people calling from all over the world now, too, which is really fun. I don't know if they'll be able to make it, but they're sure wanting to, because uh, who doesn't want to come to California in June? You know, it's not just brides. It's <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful um really up time for us because we had a really rainy year. Everybody knows our weather report. Um, so much so, Jen, you, you want to tease us, that they actually moved our tax date from April 15th to October because we had so much rain. Is that bad or what? Wow, that's got to be some kind of world record right there. I That's, that's a crazy. lot of whining, I think. You know, more whining than rain, I think. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Yeah, now, yeah. I, I brought up the movement. Now, last year I was at the movement. Yes. And had a lovely are. time. This year, Glenn gets to go. Yes. I'm and so one excited. of the things that I really enjoyed at the movement was you let you invited everyone to go on a tour oh, yeah. of Flag is Up Farms, the California Horse Center. And you talked all about all of the really fascinating and interesting and very forward thinking mm-hmm. ways that you have upgraded the facility yep. to come into line with the latest research in horse husbandry practices. And for those of you who are not old school, horse husbandry is the care and maintenance of horses, not creating baby horses. Oh yeah. Horse husband- <laughs> the, the latest research we have into how to care for your horse to keep them healthy as a horse. Are you going to be able to do that again this year? Oh, and in fact, not only are we going to say, hey, coming soon. Do you remember the signs around the farm? Lots coming of coming soon, soon signs. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Moving here. And I think what I did is as best possible was describe what we were going to be doing around the farm. Now it's going to be manifested. There's still more to do. I mean, I'm about to start putting up posters with phase one, phase two, phase three, oh, wow. because it takes a while to get through all these things. But it is fun. Yeah, we we now have 27 walkouts. Um, I and call them walkouts. Explain to everybody what a walkout is because mm-hmm. in different parts of the country, this type of living conditions is called different things. It is. Some people call them run-ins, but I always say that scares me to think about it. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I prefer the walkouts or in and out. Some people will call them in out. Some people will call them runs. Um, but that sounds like a dog thing to me. But anyway, it is the ability to for a horse to walk out into a small little area. Well, it's 12 by 20. And um, some people house horses in 12 by 20. So the stall is um, it's with a six inch matting in it too. And it, it's like walking on a tempur mattress inside the stall, which is a, they're 12 by 12, generally speaking here. And then walking out to a 12 by 20 beyond this, the, and it is also heads over the fence, which I know a lot of people are a little ooey about that. Wait a minute. My horse is going to touch noses. Yep. 
they're going to touch noses like real horses, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we do a lot. We do a lot with um, socialization of the horses, but safety is uh, paramount and, and good health is paramount too. So we have, we're going to explain our whole system of feeding, housing, uh, exercise, uh, aqua tread. It's an in-ground aqua tread for the horses. And we've got our Eurosizer, which you saw last year. Which I which want is, one of those. I'm sorry. Oh, I I, every, on every Christmas list is the yes. Eurosizer. It's really cool. It's a loose walker for those who haven't seen one. And it's oval. So it means that 80% of the time the horse's spine is straight as they're exercising, freewheeling through there. It's a big area that they loose walk in. And you can do 12 horses in there at a time if you are brave. And um, <laughs> otherwise, we do them every other. And we put an old gelding in there to teach the new newbies and we have 17 plus hand horses in those two so you know they can really stride out and stay safe and so yeah all kinds of stuff like that oh and we just had gotten the mountain trail when we were here that last was year. just barely finished the paint wasn't dry yet exactly and the plants weren't in it or anything yet so it's going to look a lot more natural this year and of course you know we've had tons of people through having fun on the mountain trail now too, as we do a uh, mountain play play date every month. And, um, we, we've enjoyed that. And it's, and that's actually probably got people talking more than even good health for their horses. Cause you know, we all giggle and have fun when we're yeah. on the mountain now, trail. Last time, last year at the movement, mm-hmm. you, people who, per, who signed up to come to the movement, had the opportunity to sign up and participate out on the trail course. Will that be part of the movement again this year? It is not. Last time, what we did was we did have Mark Bolander here, who is our designer and facilitator and builder and everything. Um, and he's not coming this year. He's on another trek. But um, but we will have participation of the transition horses on the mountain. Oh, so trail. you're going to do demos. We're going to do demos out oh, there great. too. That's great. And if yeah. people are brave, we might just hand them a horse because we actually have these off the track thoroughbreds and other horses that are coming through for the adoption program. And we need, we need trainers. So if anybody's brave enough to see if they can try their skills, the horses are brave. So, you know, we need some brave people too, uh, but it is, it's actually really fun for the horses. They really, um, their brains get engaged in this and they just have a lot of fun doing these exercises. And I think it's good for people to see groundwork. I don't know about you, Jen, but there is a whole generation of of us women who grew up, they didn't do a lot of groundwork growing up. And there's a lot of women who are balls out brave in the saddle, but you put them on the ground. They're a little shaky. You know, they're not sure where that horse is going to jump. And so we, we break it all down. And you remember from last year, it was very incremental, but we started on the ground, dually halters on everybody, helmets. What? We have to wear a helmet. We're on the ground. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Because that head weighs about 200 pounds. So, (laughs) and, um, and I think building that confidence together with your horse, he's more confident when you get in the saddle too, because now you've already walked through these and said, see, I can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. So you kind of like that. I, yes, I completely agree with you on all fronts. So Mm -hmm. if you want to sign up for the movement, how do you do it? Where do you go? Go to monteroberts.com, click on the tab at the top that says shop. The drop down says special event, and then click on that and you'll have the movement right on that page, plus a annoying pop-up will probably right, be right in your face. Anyway. There you so go. Just click and on that. If that's too complicated, just oh, go to MontyRoberts.com and call the telephone number. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the old school way. It still works. It works 100% of the time. <laughs> It never, it never, it never fails. We have not given up phones. No. It never fails. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to hear a little bit from our title sponsor, Hands on Gloves, the cleverest way ever to groom your horse or dog. And then we're going to dive into our guests today. Yeah. Jay Michelson grew up bathing and grooming horses and dogs. Raised in Texas, he always wondered why his family couldn't find a better way than the old hard-to-hold curry combs or bathing mitts that never fit and the shedding blades that literally ripped the animal's hair right out. Well, fast forward 20 years, and Jay had an idea. Frustrated by the old products still not improving after 20 years, he spent more than four years and several hundred thousand dollars developing hands-on gloves quickly realizing that the reason a quality, comparable grooming product had never been developed, they were really difficult to make right. But he did it. 
hands-on reaches far beyond the traditional curry combs, mitts, and shutters out there on the market. Wet or dry, the delicate gloves won't slip or fall off, providing both the groomer and the animal with more thorough and enjoyable grooming and bathing experiences. Constructed from durable, hypoallergenic, surgical-grade material, these lightweight gloves come in five sizes with extremely soft nodules on the fingers and palms. Trust me, hands-on gloves are the best of all the ways out there to groom your horses, dogs, and cats. Put them on your gift list, too. Find all the sizes and all the colors at handsongloves.com. Monty Roberts first gained widespread fame with the release of his New York Times bestselling book, The Man Who Listens to Horses, a chronicle of his life and development of his nonviolent horse training methods called Join Up. Monty grew up on a working horse farm as a firsthand witness to traditional, often violent methods of horse training and breaking the spirit with an abusive hand. Rejecting that, he went on to win 11 World Championships in the show ring. Well, thank you for agreeing to do this little um, new question for me. But I feel like I hear this question a lot in owners who are trying to get their brain around loving their horse, relationship with their horse, but also discipline in their horse or even just a good training regimen for their horse. They want to do the right thing for the horse, but they have a hard time. They feel sometimes like maybe a trainer is getting more from their horse, but is it worth it? When is too much too much? This is not only a good question, but it's an extremely important question. And the answer to this is oftentimes very difficult to find for a human being who's trying to uplift their horse and cause the horse to do things that they apparently don't want to do. And I have to say that experience is absolutely critical, but if I can use words to create some of that basic fundamental experience through words, then I would do that. And the clearly obvious thing is to watch for improvement. Watch closely what's happening with the ears, the eyes, the feet, the direction they're traveling, and the speed of travel. Recently, I had a um, tremendous uh, experience with a horse that didn't want to walk over a plastic tarpaulin. And, um, oh my word, at times you would think he's going to kill himself. He's just going crazy. And you step back at a time like this, you watch closely, you relax, you breathe down, and just watch the second move that he makes at that same difficult object. And if you see a little improvement then you just keep working on that improvement to swell it just a tiny bit each time. Now, sometimes you have no control and they blast through and jump and spin. That's part of horse training. Uh, but you have to ask for an uplift. Consistently uplift tiny bit and congratulate. A tiny bit and congratulate. One after another until the horse is doing exactly what you wanted them to do. You can't whip, you can't push, you can't thump on a horse and make them do something. I, I mean, I say you can't, you can. But it's detrimental to the horse, to your training, and to the future of that horse, along with people. There's no question about that. So, like watch, walking over a plastic tarpaulin. They'll put a foot on it and then, oh my goodness, every nerve in their body explodes and they fly backwards and the thing goes, but nothing hurt. Nothing hurt. So leave the one foot and just walk back and try to get another one foot on. 
And pretty soon you will have two feet on. And then as you go through it, eventually you'll have them walking over it. Now, obviously, the more experience you have at when to advance, the better off you are. But don't advance by your own theory. You watch the horse. When they will advance just a tiny bit, then breathe and leave them be. The horse I'm talking about was nuclear uh, in the beginning. And within uh, 30, 40 minutes, he was walking across what I call a lake. It's a big piece of plastic uh, tarpaulin that uh, covers 90% of my round pen. And there's a trail around it on which I put a tiny little plastic rolled up. And they don't even want to go over the plastic rolled up. Even they, they can jump it. It's only four inches high. But they don't want to do that. So you just keep sending them back there and sending them back there. And if you place it so they want to go in that direction, that's important. Because if you place it where they're going away from where you know they would want to go, it just takes longer. So you encourage them to give it a try. And within 15 or 20 minutes, he was walking over what I call the stream which is a rolled up piece of plastic tarpaulin that opened up becomes about a 12 by 12 box stall size lake or a stream that's wide, a wide stream, let's say. And in the middle of the round pen is this lake, which is 25 by 25 kind of measurement in feet. Within less than an hour and a half, this horse was following me across that huge lake. And you believe me, you would swear that his feet were on fire in those first 15 or 20 minutes, 30 minutes. You would swear you're never going to get him to walk on that plastic in the center of the round pen. And you know what? I actually began to think, maybe I'm not going to get him today. And I thought, well, that's fine. If I can't get him today, I'll get him tomorrow. And the next thing you know, when I took a breath and relaxed, he was going over the small one pretty well. So I started to unroll that. And of course, that was an uplift and it took a little while. But then I could see that he was going over it and turning around and not bolting away from it so much. He wasn't that afraid of it. So I turned him around and sent him back the other way. And then back and forth, back and forth across this little stream. Why? Because I was watching for tiny improvements. His ears forward, just looking at it. And then bouncing over it. Aha, let's bounce over it the other direction. And then the other direction. And then the other direction. And pretty soon I put the line on his head collar or halter and turned him around toward that big one in the middle. And he happened to get accidentally a foot on it. And it didn't hurt him. In fact, it was bigger and heavier and it kind of stayed down and it didn't make so much noise. Well, within three or four minutes, He was putting two feet on the big one and then three feet on the big one and then four feet on the big one. And I took the line off and walked away and he followed me across the big one. Now be careful because you have to be very observant as to what that horse might do in terms of bolting and running over the top of you when you're working on these things. So you go at it slowly and, you know, I I say that, Maybe an hour, hour and a half, uh, I had this horse walking over that big plastic. So what if it was two or three days? That's okay. If, you, if you're not comfortable and you can't breathe down and relax, quit for today. And then come back and do it again. And you might do little things like 
roll up some plastic and put in the side of his box stall so that he can see that there and it never coils up and strikes at him or some crazy thing like that. So he walks by it and then you can gradually unroll it. And pretty soon they'll be walking on it when you're not looking. And, um, and, you, and you can get some improvement that way. When I go and do demonstrations, then I have to I have a round pin and I have to put the plastic down and there's an audience sitting there and they expect me to get it done in 30 or 40 minutes. And I do. The reason I do is that I watch for the tiny improvements and then give them a rub between the eyes, to congratulate them and walk away. And they say, oh, that's what he wants. And then they give me a little more, inch by inch, bingity, bingity, bing. I, I remember this one fellow in Berlin, Germany, that uh, bet me $50 that he, uh, and he said U.S. dollars, $50. You will never get this horse, it was his horse, to walk over that plastic. And uh, that one was extra easy, and he was 25 or 30 minutes just walking across it. Why me? Why me? I have learned how to keep my pulse rate down, how to breathe, and how to accept tiny improvements. If it's not going well and you're tending to go backwards, that's too much. Wait. Stop. Think. Relax. And if you're not getting there, put him away. Come back tomorrow after you've had a chance to dream about it and think about it and talk to yourself about relaxing out there in the middle of that big plastic or whatever it is you're doing, a bridge or uh, poles to walk over, walking through water, things like that. Think about it. And if you're not relaxed, if you're not confident that you can get it done, don't do it. Get somebody to help you. Tell somebody, I know you're a good horseman. Tell me how to relax when I do this. Tell me what to look for that's positive. Show me the little uplifts that you can stop and relax and love your horse for it. Those are the things that won't cause too much to be too much. If you stay nervous, jangled, and push and get a whip uh, behind them, that's too much. If it requires that kind of thing, it's too much. So it's the stopping and watching for tiny improvements that's the answer to when is enough enough and not too much, too much. That's great. That's good advice. So now if somebody is using that trainer that you've advised, you know, if they they feel like they can't get it done and they feel it's it's a safety issue and uh, and it's important to them to have this horse walking over plastic, somebody might make a judgment call about that. But what do you how do you interact with the trainer where you feel like you need to either follow his direction because he is going to get it done or you, you know that uncomfortable owner who's not sure where they jump in with the trainer? Give us either the owner's perspective or the trainer's perspective. Well, here's where I get people against me and my methods because I, I don't know what the percentage is anymore. But in my the course of my career, I would say that in the mid-range of my career, uh, that 95% of the trainers, when a horse wouldn't walk over a piece of plastic or through the water, would say, oh, go get me my lunch whip. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's the end. Mm-hmm. I, I tell all the owners, you can simply say no. Right. I don't want to whip him to get him to do it. Uh, and, you know, you can get a horse to go over plastic with a whip. You can get him to go through water with a whip. But as he does it, he's hating you for it and trembling all over and getting ready to test you with the next thing that you do and fight the whip 
remember that they are positive thigmotaxic. And that means go into the whip, go after the whip. No, force, pain, and uh, dominance over the horse is not the answer. And if you find you have a trainer that's asking you to do that, say, thank you very much, but I'm going home now and uh, my horse is going with me. And uh, you get someone that doesn't use force, pain, and domination in order to get the job done. That's great. Thank you. Good advice. They can go to your book, From My Hands to Yours, and look at if they're a reader, or go on your uni, MontyRobertsUniversity.com, and see all these uh, various lessons that you have to attacking this issue from many different sides. And yeah, I, I think you know better than I do, Debbie, but I believe that the lake and stream that I'm talking about is on our university. It sure is. Yeah, and as as God is my judge... We have saved the lives of dozens and dozens of horses based upon the work that you can see there. In fact, it's a high probability that the one that the um, people brought that were the officials in Kansas or somewhere. Ah, for Joe Camp? For Joe Camp, Mm -hmm. the guy who made the Benji movies. That horse was dragged over things that it didn't want to walk over. Yeah. With a chain around its neck and a tractor dragging it. Mm -hmm. And the animal rights people... Yeah, took it away. Mm -hmm. Took it away from him. I think he got a jail sentence. And uh, they brought it here, and um, Joe Camp saw this horse walking over the plastic uh, tarpaulin, um, the lake, and... Um, adopted that horse. Yeah, and, and that's Mouse. Yeah, a lot of people will remember that story. It's one of the most touching stories in Joe Camp's first book about horses, The Soul of a Horse. Um, and his name was Mouse, and he's a beautiful, it was a scrawny little filly. Do you remember when we first met her? Because she was, you know, really not treated well. Right. And um, almost turned up feet and all that, you know, yeah. that neglect. But I, I wish it was just neglect. It was abuse as well and turned into a beautiful flaxen-maned uh, pet. I mean, the family. family. Yeah. In addition to getting the job done, it's more fun mm. to do it that way. Mm-hmm. It's far more fun. To, I mean, if you're having fun whipping a horse, yeah. um, I don't need to deal with you. Yeah. Uh, if that's fun for somebody, nope. Uh, thank you very much. Not for me. Uh, if you have to force them to do it, no. You can encourage them to do it. There's so many ways that you can present the object to them and then watch them learn how to do it by simply using body language and, uh, and um, you know, the dually halter is, is a help to you uh, because it gets more comfortable as they yield to it. That's okay, but to stand back and whip one to get it done uh, just isn't my way, nor should it be, in my opinion, anybody's way. Right, and this applies to trailer loading, walking over um, a bridge, any anything, any obstacle. So a trail horse, any horse that you're twi- trying to teach cooperation with, to partner with, yes? Yeah, in... in, in um, 35 years of traveling to 41 countries, I did something over 3,000 horses that were bona fide no-loaders. They would not load. And I told every owner, um, you can ride your horse there if you can't load it. And if I can't load it in 30 minutes or so, I'll ride it home. And I almost had to ride one home in Germany, but I never had to ride one horse home over 3,000 horses, most of which we didn't even take unless they hadn't been able to load them for two years or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Really tough horses. And they will consistently say, and this guy got out his whip and this horse, and, and then the vets had to come because the horse fell down and hurt itself and so forth. Um, 
they will load. Not only will they load, but most of those 3,000 horses, more than 3,000, it was about 3,500, most of them would follow me in with no lead on at the end of a 30 or 40 minute session. So nonviolence is the answer. Then you have to figure out how do I notice improvement? Too much is too much. And when it's right, it's not too much because you're not forcing anything to happen. Watch for that little piece of improvement. And that is probably the most difficult assignment we give people, but it's a fun target to hit. And um, I think that's where experience and practice and then caring for the horse will get people further yeah, along. C- c- come to my courses and, and, and see me do it and, and um, bring, bring one that won't load. Mm. I'd love it. <laughs> uh, even in my condition today at 88 years of age, um, I can still do that, and uh, it is so much fun to watch the horse like doing something rather than doing it because they're frightened not to. That's great. We have some Monty Specials training coming up, too. Your courses uh, this summer, as we speak, it's 2023, and um, it'll be interesting, and most of those will go up on the uni as well if they're educationally um, interesting at all. Yeah. So we look forward to that. Incidentally, I'm not 88 yet. I think I have about 30 days. Yeah. <laughs> left. You rounded I'm up. 88. I'm 88 in 23. So that's right. There we are. And um, in horse age, you are because January 1. You oh boy. Even... <laughs> that's for sure. In, in horse birthdays, I, I am 88. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts. And I'm coming to you now to talk about the Monty Roberts Online University. You know, there ought to be six months in everybody's life where they just live with their animals. I've been staying home. But three months now, I've been home with this virus thing. And the things I'm learning, we're bringing you a new series. What Horses See, How Horses See, and About Horses Seeing Things. The online university is bringing you the last three years of my learning process, which I promise you is the learningest years I ever spent. The Monty Roberts Online University, uh, you won't miss a minute of it if you get started on it. I love bringing it to you and it's my shot to take my concepts to the next generation. Nicole Chastain has achieved USDF bronze, silver, and gold medals and is a USDF L graduate with distinction. Today, Nicole chats with us about the fast-growing discipline of working equitation and offers interesting insight from a judge's point of view. Well, I'm sitting with Nicole Chastain Price, and I'm excited to talk about something that I know very little about. So she's going to just pretend like I know nothing, and I'm going to ask, I hope not silly questions, but at least questions that might get more people even interested in working equitation. So I'm going to ask, you know, she's a dressage trainer, so we know that she will be precise. I will be imprecise, but I'll try to make it sound as if um, you can do a lot with any horse that you're riding right now. I know I have a great friend named Nellie who has a little quarter horse that she's now just traipsed off to Germany with. Um, but she was so intrigued by the garrocha pole and by the big hind end on her quarter horse that could that be a, a discipline for her? And she was interested. In it. So when she got interested in it, I got interested. And then I met Nicole. And I'm glad to have Nicole sitting here too so that I can pick her brain to know more about it because I haven't delved into it. And I wonder if a lot of our listeners haven't either. Um, but before you do, let's find out all about it from one of the top um, thought leaders, really, as a judge, right? You're you're pretty much involved in every part of working act, as well as a lot of things we, we can talk about too, but we're going to focus on working act today because I'm curious. 
Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm really excited about working at Quotation. It's been a growing sport in the United States since we formally started organizing in 2008. Um, a lot of people think it's a new sport, but it's actually been around. It was starting to come to fruition in Europe in the, in the 90s, and then our first World Championships was in 2002, the European Championships. And um, the larger governi- governing international body of working equitation is called the World Association of Working Equitation. And yeah, that... You, you had a cute name for that. What do you call that? We Wa- call it Huawei. Huawei. <laughs> I like that. We call it Huawei. They're sort of our guide. And each country um, applies for status as an internationally recognized country. And to do that, you have to have certain things in place, like a coherent rule book that you're in an organization that your country agrees on. Um and one of the other things is that you've presented to them your national tack and attire, which we'll get into later, in order to be able to compete internationally. But essentially, it's a little bit like the FEI, where it oversees the sport broadly internationally. There's one inter- international level called the master's level in which we compete internationally. And then underneath that, each country is able to design their lower level rules and their um, their rule book specifically to their country. So in that, the United States just received the Huawei recognition last year, and that was after years of the country having many organizations that then filtered down to one. Um, Our current national organization is called the United States Association of Working Equitation. So it's USAWE.org. Wow. And it's got a great website where it explains the sport. It talks about the different phases. And so that's a great resource. It has our rule book online. Oh, good. Um, And then within USAWE, there are um, state or local affiliates that can apply for status. And we've... Um, I have just organized that our sort of local chapter, which is the California Central Coast um, Working Equitation Association, has been accepted as an affiliate organization under USAWE, which just means we're a club that spans, you know, a range on the Central Coast that is just here to support and um, sort of grow and, and do outreach and education in our area to help grow the sport locally. So that organization has been around since 2011 when another local trainer um, named Adriana Silvestri and her partner then, Agapito, um, started it. And it was just sort of a loose gathering. And when they moved, I took it over. But that that is sort of how working equitation is growing in areas it's growing as grassroots. So even though it's been here for a while, since 2008, um, a lot of people still aren't familiar with the sport. So we're trying to work really hard within our country to grow it. And it is one of the fastest growing sports in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think part of equestrian that. Equestrian sports? Or equestrian sports. sports. Yeah. yeah, mm-hmm. as, yeah. W- as a discipline. And I think the reason is because it's very inclusive to different disciplines and breeds. So, we allow, we have um, four different phases. So I'll start out talking basically about what the sport is. The sport was designed to honor the working horse culture of each country. So each country has sort of a working horse tradition. And in that, I mean, working country horses, like working ranch horses, mm-hmm. working cattle, Um so in, in Portugal, that's the Lusitano horse. In Spain, that's the Andalusian horse. And they have their country's national tack and attire and their traditions. So in Spain, they use a garrocha to work cattle. Right. Um, and other countries, they have different traditions. So the Colombian team that was actually represented at the World Championships in France last year, they had this uh, sort of... Um, you know, piece of material, a cloth, which I'm sorry, I'm not educated to say what it is, but they use that like a cape kind of thing, or something. It's it's sort of something that they hold, you know. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. while you're not allowed to touch the cattle in the cattle phase, you're allowed to you use your country's tradition. So, for example, in America, we're a roping culture. A lot of people have the ropes on the saddles, and they might, you know tap them on the saddle, but they're not allowed to take them out and rope the horses. Okay. Um, if you are representing Spain, they are allowed to use their garrocha pole because that is part of their country's tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really interesting in how the sport kind of came about. And 
Really, it, it was very much propagated and designed to help be a marketing tool for the Iberian horses and the horses in the Iberian Peninsula. So that's why you see when you look it up online, you'll see a lot of that look. Um, but to be very clear, having worked with one of the Huawei judges who's done a lot of our judge education in the United States, his name is Antonio Vicente. He is a Huawei judge as, as well as a dressage judge. Um, he's done a lot of studies on the horses and breeds being used and it's it's under 50% of the horses are Lusitanos. Um, I, I think people have a misnomer that they have to look like that or they have to have this big fancy horse. Mm -hmm. One of the most famous people that comes up when you Google is Pedro Torres and his horse Oxidado, which he was an incredible example of, of working equitation. But I think a lot of people look at that and go, oh, I, I can't look like that. Well, I liken that to a lot of people aren't going to look like Stefan Peters. Point. And his <laughs> Olympic horses right. when they ride or Isabel Worth, you know, right. we're not all going to the Olympics. Right. And that is is what we're really trying to get across to people um, in the United States is you know, we have a lot of support for our lower, lower levels as well. And we see breeds ranging from, you know, gypsy vanners to ponies to draft crosses to quarter horses, Arabians, um, you know, all kinds of warm bloods, uh, all kinds of Iberian horses and crosses, and they all look a little different, but yeah. they're all required to perform the same maneuvers okay. with the same standards. So, so if your horse is built for this, they can do it. It doesn't matter what color they are. Correct. And you see a lot of horses that aren't built for okay. it. Okay. And still can do it. Okay. You know, they may not be going to the highest level. Sure. But I like to think that all horses can do this at the lower level. So... In our phases, we have a dressage phase, and that is run a little differently than competitive dressage, and it is a little different than competitive dressage because we're not rewarding or looking for these huge scopey gates because if you have a working horse mm -hmm. and you have this huge floaty trot and you have to like really quickly adjust or you have this bounding over the ground canter, which is great, but you can't adjust it, it's going to be hard to, to actually work a cow or get to an obstacle or, you know, get to a gate. Yeah. It's hard to maneuver unless you have a little bit of, of kind of quick go come back. Mm -hmm. um, so our tests are designed in a 20 by 40 meter court. They're all run at all levels at that. And it's, they're designed to really showcase the obedience. Um, and I don't even really like that word obedience, but the partnership and the mm -hmm. harmony. That's good. So yeah. that the horse is really on the aids mm -hmm. um, and that they're partners, I think, mm -hmm. is, is a better way of looking at than obedient. But we want the horses very... Um, very supple, connected. Um, our ideal balance is a little bit more uphill than the typical Western horse, but maybe not so much loft as the typical dressage horse. So using correct dressage training basics in terms of gymnasticizing and balancing mm -hmm. and um, you know, connecting the horse through the back from back to front mm -hmm. so that the horse is really an adjustable partner mm -hmm. um, is where our dressage phase comes from. And we see horses coming in that um, are coming from the regular dressage ring. We see them coming in from the ranch horse world. Mm -hmm. We see horses coming in from eventing. We see them coming in uh, from people just starting now that are just that have never done anything and, and are just starting, yeah. or you know, That's horses right. that have washed out as rainers or rain cow horses. Um, so really, horses from all disciplines. And as long as they start to really understand that we're looking for a level balance and then starting to create a little uphill balance, the horses have to track up from behind and, and articulate their joints. Um, you know, I think any, any breed can really do it. And I think the exercises that are showcased in the tests are exercises that help prepare the horses for then the second phase, which is, um, it's called ease of handling. And that's our obstacle phase. Right. So our obstacle phase has recognized. She smiled when she said yeah. that. <laughs> Everyone Obstacles likes, are fun. <laughs> Everyone wants to do the, no one wants to do the dressage, but they want to get to the obstacles. Yeah. <laughs> and then they realize that the dressage is the base of our sport sure. in, in, a, in a training sense, not in a competitive dressage sense. I, but If I were to go to the dressage part before you go to the obstacles, which are fun, um, would you say, you know, fill in the blank, we, we just love it when we see this out in there. In the dressage phase, we just love it when we see really clear partnerships and happy horses yeah. um, swinging, you know, through the back and happy expressions and um, and accuracy. You know, that's that's what we're really looking for in the dressage phases. Okay. So, um, you know, rewarding training and partnership over brilliance. And of course, if you do all of the things and you have a really lovely moving horse, you know, your score might be a little higher, but it's 
it's because of the way the tests are designed, it's, it kind of really levels the playing field, yeah. I think. Um, and also where we place our coefficients, really reward training okay. over gates. Yeah. Um, we do want to see, we have to see pure gates. So if we see lateral walks where the walks are not pure four beat or canners that become lateral in the canner because of tension in the back and they're, or they're a little four beat because they're losing impulsion, mm-hmm. you know, that will take the scores down. Um, I should insert quickly here. There is, um, a concession for gated horses. Oh, so the gated horses yeah. right now, um, they do still have to have a pure walk and a pure canter, but their trot is called their intermediate, their, their saddle gate, whatever their saddle okay. gate is, their okay. intermediate saddle gate. And as long as that, we're not a breed show. So it's not my job to judge whether you're on what breed of, of gated horse, mm-hmm. but as long as you show me your gate and you maintain the gate, um, I judge it like that. And we do give some training to our judges for gated horses. Not enough, in my opinion. Um, and it's been a big discussion whether the gated horses will stay being judged against non-gated horses or will, whether they'll have their own division. Yeah. In Western dressage, they have their own division. So the requirements are the same, but they're judged against other gated horses. Um, we did that at first, and then I think uh, there was some talk about them not feeling included. Then we included them. I think it's very difficult to score because it's it's sort of comparing apples to oranges. Yeah. But right now, if you come in with a gated horse, you're just doing your intermediate gate and you're judged, you know, equally. Yeah. And honestly, as a um, a judge, um, I say most of the time where I see gated horses lose points is not because of their gait. It's because they break gait, you yeah. know, or yeah. their circles aren't round or they're not bending or, you know, That's accuracy. Training. It's yeah. training. It's yeah. not necessarily because they're gated. Um so anyway, then when we go to the obstacle phase, so here I'm smiling again, <laughs> um, we use a lot of the exercises we had in our dressage tests to work towards the obstacles. So, you know, symmetrical circles, consistent tempo, um, consistent engagement, c- maintaining the energy, maintaining clear bending and flexion when it's appropriate, um, you know, suppleness, and then the transition. So for example, one of the ways our obstacles differ from, you know, like a ranch horse class or or an obstacle you know trail class is that within every obstacle we're in our point system which i should have mentioned earlier for people that aren't familiar in dressage at zero to ten it in our obstacles at zero to ten so zero is being like not performed and ten is the best Mm -hmm. um if you are are going for you know your your score let's say you're going to our bridge um our bridge score is going to consider the approach to the bridge, how straight you were, how balanced your transition was, the the straightness, relaxation, and connection and quality of your walk over the bridge, the confidence of how your horse feels over the bridge, that it comes off of the bridge without, you know, um, balance issues or tension, and that it makes a really clear, correct transition after the bridge back up to the next gate required. So all of those things are required in the bridge score. So some of them are modifiers. The most important part of the obstacle is the criteria of the obstacle. And in our rule book, we have each obstacle described. It talks about the criteria and the judging criteria and and kind of what we're expecting and what things are serious faults. So, you know, if you read the rule book, it really gives you, you know, a very good idea of kind of what we're expecting. But we can't include everything in the rule book. So that's why it's really important to take lessons or go to clinics and stuff so you can really understand, you know, how our approach and how, you know, what we're looking for and how to ride the obstacle phase happens. Well, A, Nicole has the best voice ever for podcasting. (laughs) She is good. Fascinating stuff. And I've, I've only just gotten a little tiny taste of working equitation and I really enjoy it. And I'm curious to hear what else she has to say. And we're going to have her on the next episode, too. We are. Because there's so much to learn about a new, you know, it's it's not that new, actually. She'll tell you that it goes back to its roots in the 90s in Europe. You can just hear the delight in her voice of being able to expand outside of just that very tight dressage discipline, you know. So the episode where we have Nicole come back will come out the 1st of May, I believe. Yes. So make sure exactly. you tune into that. And if you haven't done so already on your podcast player, make sure that you have subscribed to Horsemanship Radio. That way you won't miss it. It'll just come directly to your phone automatically. So Very tune good. in. Yeah. Whisper the language of the herd. The 
listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we'd like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the herd. Ask Monty Part 2. The original question was, I was just wondering if you have to use an enclosed area for join-up as I live on a Scottish island and it is hard to get access to one. Would a small field do? Round pens have been constructed of many different materials, logs, planks, stones, or even tires. In recent years, I've seen many round pens made of solar tape. People actually tell me that once a horse is trained to the electrical tape, this works just fine. History shows that round pins, which were originally used as part of a traditional training, have varied inside over the centuries. The methods used were often brutal, and many of these structures had a solid post in the center to restrain untrained horses. I have seen sizes varying between 30 feet, 10 meters, and 150 feet, 50 meters in diameter. On my farm flag is up, I built my round pens with a solid plank walls approximately 8 feet high. They are 50 feet 16 meters in diameter. I consider this to be the optimum size for normal saddle horses of 14 to 17 hands. The factor I observe most closely in determining pen size is the capability of the horses I am working to canter, maintaining the same lead, front and rear. Very big warm bloods may require a slightly larger diameter in order to move in a coordinated manner. For the smaller breeds, the diameter can actually come down to about 46 feet with no problem. One of the most critical aspects of a round pin is the footing, which is both important for the safety and performance of the horse. Any accepted horse show style of soil or artificial surface is acceptable so long as it offers good traction as well as good cushioning. While my walls slope slightly outward at the top, I have learned that this is not a necessity to clear the legs of the rider. A wall straight up and down will do just fine. On my travels around the world in recent years, I have worked with portable round pins. They are made of welded mesh wire so that people can see what I am doing and that the fence is straight up and down. I have dealt with more than 7,000 horses for public audiences, and whether it's not just luck... All these horses have remained physically sound through the process. It is a good idea to place the round pin in an area as free of distractions as possible. Horses will respond to educational sessions far better when not disturbed by the sight of other horses, people, animals, or other activities. A hedge around the round pin can often assist in this effort. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. In May, May 1 through 13, Introductory Course of Horsemanship. That is the complete intro course. Then May 1 through 3, we break it up into the mods. Mod 1 is 1 through 3. 4 through 6 is the mod 2. 8 through 10 is the mod 3. And 11 through 13 is the preparation for the intro exams. So you get the whole package broken up into at the same time into the uh, mods. And then on May 19th, we have Horsemanship 101. Those are fun. It's the girlfriend uh, weekend or the mother-daughter. It's really fun. And then on May 20, we have Mountain Trail Play Day. We talked about that earlier. Then June 5 through 9, we have Gentling Wild Horses. It's really fun. Wait till you see the horses that we've got prepared prepared for that one. And then June 10 is our mountain trail play day. And June 16 through 18 is what Jen and I talked about the movement in Solvang, California. So it's in, we're on the central coast and in July, long-term planners on the eighth, we have a mountain trail play day, the 10th through the 14th. We have a Monty special training. The 15th, we have a horsemanship 101 and 31st of July to August four is our gentling wild horse course. That's as far as I'll take you for today. And you can find all of that and more, MontyRoberts.com. The podcast is at Mm MontyRoberts.com. Monty's store where you can get dually halters, DVDs, sign up for the movement, MontyRoberts.com. Monty Roberts Q&A. There's a storehouse of the questions there. The university is there. It's all at MontyRoberts.com. Debbie has very cleverly put it all in one place. (laughs) Thank you very much.
Yeah. Just put like it a, all there. It's like a hay pillow. There, <laughs> like a hay pillow. <laughs> Monty's calendar is there. If you want to talk to a real life human being who can be helpful and kind, 805 688 6288 is where you're going to find that person. You're going to go to horsemanshipradio.com for today's links, or you can go to moneyroberts.com for today's link because the same information is right there on moneyroberts.com. And we love your feedback. Where can they find, where can they uh, leave feedback, Debbie? They can leave feedback on Facebook. That's facebook.com forward slash Monty Roberts or Twitter, twitter.com forward slash Monty underscore Roberts and Instagram. And that's instagram.com forward slash Monty underscore Roberts. Roberts forward slash. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Thank you very much to our title sponsor. Yeah. Hands on gloves, the cleverest way ever to groom your horse or dog. And it's that season. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And Monty Roberts university.com too, which is a storehouse. We have about 750 lessons on there now. Monty Roberts university.com. And be sure to visit all the other great shows on the horse radio network too at horse radio network.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. 